so my name's Anita Fortes and I'm um, a professional organiser. My business is called Anita Life Professional Organising and I operate in Norfolk. And that, actually looking at that photograph, that was when you could get a haircut and it's been a long time since then. But um, I just um, want to say thank you so much for coming along. Um, hopefully you're going to find this interesting. Um, if you've got any questions that you want to ask, please do put them in the chat and I'll endeavour to answer them either as we go along or at the end. So um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this webinar was to shine a bit of a light really on um, professional organising and mental health because there's a really close link. So when I tell people that I'm a professional organiser, they're, they often don't know what that is, but actually it's um, an industry that's growing quite, quite a lot in this country. It's been well established in America and in Australia for many years. So if you go over to an America and say, you know, you have a professional organiser, then everybody knows what that means. Um, we have a, a UK body here called APDO, that's the Association of professional declutterers and organisers. And there are around 380 verified members now, and it's really grown in the last five or so years. The organisation itself has been going for about 16 years. So we deal with people's, um, their space, their home, organising their space and home, dealing with clutter, helping them to show off their space to the best advantage, um, and then some of us deal with clutter, disorganisation and hoarding as well. So, you know, most professional organisers, not all, but most have got some kind of specialism because it's quite a broad industry. So I put this photograph up top right on purpose because sometimes when people know about professional organising, they think it's, you know, this kind of work really making people's interiors look absolutely wonderful and um, hello ready and some organizers do do that kind of work you know some have got a background in interiors um, you know and that's all great because there's definitely a need for that but I also put this photograph at the bottom which shows my boot uh, the boot of my car and how it looks <laughs> most of the time because <laughs> I tend not to do the work that's in the picture at the top I tend to do the real sort of you know very very cluttered and sometimes hoarded homes so my boot and one of the rooms in my house is always full of stuff one of the things we I always do is recycle as much as possible there's a, a big ethos in Apto around reusing, recycling, and not sending things um, to landfill. I would say that probably 98% of the, the things that I take from people's homes, because they wanted me to take them, you know, they want me to take them away and do something with them. 98% will go to charity and will go to good causes. So at the moment, a couple of the people who live in my village are collecting for Christmas boxes for families that really need it and I've been able to give them such a lot of you know really good quality things that people no longer want so the clients that I work with tend to be incredibly generous in, in giving away their things for others so yeah we've got uh, photo organizers some people specialize in that there's a massive demand for that you know we all know people who've got boxes and boxes of hard copies of photographs and they don't know what to do with them. There are also people with, you know, thousands of digital images and they don't know what to do with them either. So the photo organizers are very skilled and they will organize them and digitize things and put them in photo books. They do an amazing job. And then there are people who work um, sort of in the home moving arena. Um, and I do quite a bit of this as well. Some um, do specifically home staging, so they will get homes ready for sale so that they are presented to their best to maximise the chances of them being sold and also uh, maximising the price. Um, I help people quite a lot with the actual organising of moves. So getting them ready for a move, organising on move day, and then getting them sorted out 
at the other end after the move. So, so there's quite a range within the industry. There's also people like me who tend to work a little bit more with people who've got more complex needs. And I suppose this is where the sort of mental health connection comes in. Um, I've got a background in mental health. I've got a background in mental, uh, in sort of, sorry, in special needs. So I suppose it's kind, I feel like I never intended to sort of specialise in that area, but it feels a little bit like it's found me strangely. Um, I also work people who've got neurodiversity and also those with hoarding difficulties. So, you know, there's quite, that's quite a big area within itself. So when people um, ask me how I got into professional organising, for many years I used to say, oh, well, you know, I've always been very organised and I used to be a nurse and you have to be very organised to that and I used to be a teacher. And I taught very young children, you know, four and five year olds, and you've got to organise yourself and them, and you've got to organise the class. And that, you know, I do think that's got something to do with it. But it was only when I was talking to some other APTO colleagues, and they were saying, um, well, one of them in particular was saying that she, um, she felt that she'd become a professional organiser because she grew up in quite a hoarded house. And another was saying that, yeah, you know, she'd spoken to other organisers that had grown up in quite a cluttered environment. And, and it kind of twigged a bit with me. And I thought, my goodness, that actually was me, although I'd never made that connection. And um, but when I look back, um, I grew up in, in a home that was um, very warm and welcoming. There were lots of very positive things. There was always people coming in and out. It was quite a sociable house, but there was always a lot of clutter and it was kind of scattered everywhere. So there was a quite a high level of disorganisation. And if you look at these photographs, so the top left is the computer area and you can see there's just like, you know, a random selection of things there. On the right, that's a windowsill. Again, you know, just a variety of objects. And then the bottom one is um, a kitchen cupboard. And you can see that things have just kind of been thrown in there. They've probably been there. They were, in fact, I know that those things in there have been there for years. So um, there was, for me growing up, <laughs> I remember feeling anxiety about the fact that I always seem to be surrounded by a lot of stuff and it definitely had an impact on me. Um, I remember feeling quite anxious about it. I would try and tidy up um, and it would just be the same um, a few hours later and I soon learned that actually I was sort of fighting a bit of a losing battle. It had an educational impact because there was never anywhere to do any studying so I'd come home with my homework I could never find a free space to work because every area would be cluttered and then there was a social impact I felt quite embarrassed about it and I didn't want to take friends home funnily enough it didn't seem to bother my older sister she didn't seem to be concerned about it but I definitely remember it affecting me and feeling just like why, why can't I live in a home that my friends have, have got, like similar to my friends, because I'd go around to their house and it'd be really tidy. And, you know, no, no, I'm not saying it would be immaculate or anything, but you would be able to sit on the sofa without having to move bags and coats off first, without having to move magazines and newspapers. You'd be able to go and make something to eat in the kitchen without there being loads of dirty plates and pots and pans scattered around. You'd be able to find somewhere to sit and relax and you'd definitely be able to find a space to study. So um, I think that part of the reason why I've come into this work is because I kind of know how it feels to live in a cluttered environment. Um, I know the anxiety it can cause, I know the distress it can cause, and I know that it can have a big impact on you know, all areas of your life, really. So what is clutter? Well, there's loads of dictionaries, isn't there? And every dictionary will say something slightly different, but the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as 
a lot of objects in a state of being untidy. And you can see in this photograph, um, which is a previous client of mine, there's just far too much stuff in that space. Look at the shoes piled up at the bottom and then you've got things just shoved on shelves. And it gets, you know, it gets quite hard to find things and you end up wasting so much time because before you can get to what you want, you're having to rummage through a load of other stuff first. So why have we got so much clutter? Well, we're a consumer society, aren't we? And we've followed America. I mean, it's no wonder that in America, um, you know, professional organizing is such um, a big sort of industry. I mean, granted, they've got a massive population in America and they tend to have bigger houses anyway, but they're much further on in consumerism. And we've gone a fair way, I think, to catch them up. So we buy a lot of stuff. And I remember, you know, uh, I'm old enough to remember when you only really bought things when you needed them. You didn't sort of buy them as a hobby. Whereas now, you know, we've got terms like um, shop till you drop, clutter therapy. You know, I know people that go out shopping uh, as a hobby, not because they particularly need anything, but just because they sort of like buying and they've got into that habit. There's also the fact that we've got really busy lives and there are lots of competing demands. So sometimes um, clients will contact me because, um, you know, their, their, their lives are busy, they've got children, they're um, busy with work and they haven't decluttered for a while and things have just built up. So it might be, you know, the kitchen or a hallway, a utility area, it might be the garage that's not been looked at for years and years. And they just want somebody to come in and help them to sort it out quickly. Um, they, they're not doing it by themselves because, you know, their time is precious and they want to spend it doing other things. They want to spend it on things that they enjoy. Um, so yeah, our busyness definitely has an impact. And then there are transitions. I mean, well, the obvious one is when we have children, because we can go from having a reasonably organized home and knowing where everything is and having space for things. And then a baby arrives <laughs> and it completely changes. Um, you know, babies have to have so much stuff. Equipment up with all these clothes and you've got to put it somewhere. So sometimes life events throw us into a little bit of, of chaos and clutter. And then there's the skill and knowledge to be able to do it. You know, not everybody's got the skills to stay organised. My job shows me that, you know, time and time again. And clients will say to me, well, you know, I wasn't brought up to be organised. I, I was brought up in a, a sort of a chaotic home. Things weren't put away. We didn't know where things were. And I just haven't learned those skills. So there can be a, a variety of reasons. <clears throat> I just wondered whether there was anything that you can see in this photograph that might have um, might have contributed to the the, the, the room getting like this. This, this is a, a client of mine. Would anybody, anybody it's obvious that there's a new baby in the home? Yeah, yeah. There's actually um, two children in this home. There's a, a five year old and a baby. You're exactly right. Yes. Any other comments? We've had one in the chat. Overshadowing. Sorry. L laundry, not like I guess not putting the laundry away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, children, a baby, not putting the laundry away. So there's something called finishing the cycle. So when we do a task, whatever that task is. So say for example the laundry. You know, we take our dirty clothes off. Hopefully we'll put them in a laundry basket, 
then we wash the clothes and then we get the clothes dry by whatever means and then we fold them and then we put them away and very often the people that I work with they don't finish the cycle so they will start something they'll get halfway through or maybe even three quarters way through or maybe even just a quarter way through <laughs> and then they just leave it and then if they're doing that with a lot of different tasks then obviously a, a, a clutter and a and a disorganization can occur but this family said to me that you know they have always been they when they said described what happened they said they'd always been quite organized sorry they'd always been quite disorganized but it was functional and they could find things and they kind of knew where things were and it never really got too bad but then when they got children that life event kind of threw them a bit and they found it really hard to stay on top of things. And um, my client said to me, the reason why she'd contacted me was because, or, you know, she could have contacted any organiser, but she would made contact because um, the baby who was very young, she was only six months old, was poorly one night and she wanted to take her temperature, you know, to inform what she should do next. And she couldn't find the thermometer anywhere because she, she didn't know where it was and she said she was she knew it was in this bedroom somewhere and she was rooting through she could and she ended up in an absolute panic and got really upset and distressed because it took her so long to find it and that was the thing that made her think right okay i'm gonna start getting on top of this but she felt it got to the stage where most of the rooms were actually like this and it got to a stage where she just couldn't, um, she just couldn't take it anymore. It was causing her a lot of stress. Her and her husband were falling out about it because they were blaming each other, you know. So, um, so it can quite easily happen. So I wanted to talk a little bit about chronic disorganisation because it's something that um, you know, isn't talked about very much really. And, and, and I see it quite a lot in my work. So um, thinking about what it is, well, it, it's, it's a consequence rather than a diagnosis. So it's not a diagnosis in itself. It's, it's a result of something else. And the disorganization usually persists over quite a long period of time. So people will say to me, I've always been disorganised. I've always struggled with it. I even remember being disorganised as a child. I could never find my uh, school book. I could ne never find my pens. I was disorganised at school. So, and it can really undermine the quality of life because it kind of has a ripple effect. You know, I can't find the keys. I'm always late for things. I overbuy because I can't, I don't know what I've got. Again, repeated attempts at self-help so very often um, you know I'll work with people who they've got all the books they've got the Marie Kondo books they've got the organizing books they've watched the videos on YouTube and they'll do it they'll be able to follow it for a short period of time and then they, they, they really struggle to keep it going and there are some visible signs so an unkempt attire, lots of paper, craft materials and photos. And then they often start projects, but leave them unfinished. So you see little bits of DIY all over the place. And this actually describes my dad quite well. Um, so, you know, he will start something and not finish it. He struggles to keep himself presented well you know he needs somebody there to say to him you need to have a shave dad you're starting to look a bit you know you need a shave you need to change that top dad can you see you've got some stains down it because he just wouldn't bother otherwise so um you know thinking back to those pictures i showed you from my home you know i can definitely see that there was chronic disorganization there So what factors might lead to chronic disorganisation? Because um, as I said before, it's not a diagnosis within itself. So there are neurological conditions that, that lead to it. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD or ADD, people who are on the autism spectrum, 
There are mental health conditions like anxiety and depression, learning disabilities, people who've got hoarding disorder that I'll come on to later. I work quite a lot with elderly clients who um, are just starting with early stage dementia and they forget where they've put things, they forget that they've done things. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which that strong link with anxiety and then um, acquired brain injury, like traumatic brain injury. And then people that just lack the skills and systems because they've never learned them. So executive functioning is, is really important to this because um, executive function are the processes we need every day to organize ourselves. We completely take them for granted. We just assume that we will be able to plan and organize and make decisions and pay attention and concentrate and follow instructions and that we'll have a good working memory. But if you've got a neurological condition or you've got, um, you know, you're suffering with your mental health, then um, executive function is going to be somewhat impaired. And then obviously all of these things that we need to keep our lives organised, to keep our home organised and get through the day, they're obviously going to be affected. So this is um, an example of where just one thing, one task that you might do in a day can be affected if you're unable to carry out some of those processes. So if the post arrives and you've got to go through this process, haven't you, of thinking, who is it from? Do I recognise the writing? Is it official or personal? Do I want to hear from these people? Could it be important? Can I face it? It might be a bill. Can I pay it? Have I got the energy for it right now? Maybe you've not got the energy. Maybe you're feeling a little bit depressed or a bit under the weather and you just can't open that envelope. If you do open it, is it good news? Do I need to take action straight away? Do I know what's needed? Can I deal with it later? Does it need to be kept? If I do keep it, where am I going to put it? Should I file it? Should I scan it? Should I shred it? Can it be recycled? If it can be recycled, where should I put it? And do I even have a filing system? And, you know, so many people faced with all of that, faced with all of those decisions to make, will just put it in a plastic bag or put it in a pile like my father does or shove it in a corner somewhere or even, I mean, I've seen mail shoved under beds, you know, just put it out of the way. I can't face it now. I can't look at it. So um, thinking about, you know, neurological um, conditions and particularly ADHD, this is a client that I worked with last year. She is um, very successful in her work. She's got a really good job. Um, she is very creative. She's a very creative. She's a very capable person. But and normally she's kind of on top of things and can manage okay. But then she moved house and it kind of sent her into a bit of a tailspin. And when she moved, she had all this stuff to sort out because she'd got a new environment. The rooms were different. The storage was different. The space was different. And um, the first photograph shows one of the bedrooms, but every room kind of replicated this. This was about 18 months after the move and you can see that the packing boxes are still there and the, um, you know, all of the packing materials and she's still got some boxes are unopened, some are opened and some bits have been taken out. You know, so it's just a complete medley of things really. And what she said to me was that um, because she finds it so difficult to prioritise, to you know, to decide what she needs to do first and then what the next step is and then what the next step is over that. She kind of ends up doing it all at once and it just ends up in an absolute pickle. Um, and she had, she'd moved into this house and she wanted to, there wasn't very much storage. It was a, a typical traditional 
Victorian terrace and she wanted to put some fitted wardrobes into the alcoves upstairs. So instead of doing some of the unpacking and clearing the space and doing some of the work that she needed to do before the wardrobes uh, were ordered, you know, doing it in that logical sequence, she'd ordered this flat pack furniture, these huge wardrobes, so they were downstairs just lying all over the, the lounge and the rear room because she wasn't in a place to be able to start putting those wardrobes. wardrobes. So she was doing things in the wrong order and, and, you know, it was kind of, the disorganisation was just increasing. And actually, you know, just by putting her a schedule together of what she needed to do first, what came next, then the next thing, then the next thing, that really helped her a lot because that was one of the things she found most difficult. And we did quite a bit of clearing and we did quite a lot of decluttering. She actually sent a lot of stuff to charity. Um, so just with that bit of support and help, it can make um, you know, a huge difference. So I work quite a lot with people who have got hoarding difficulties of varying levels. So this image is um, of a, a client's house who I work with. I work with her on um, a monthly basis because she really struggles to let go of paperwork. And when you think of how many categories, because <laughs> as professional organisers, we think in terms of categories. And when you think of how many categories of paper there are, it's quite shocking and you only really realise how many there are when you work with people who hoard paper because there are books, there are magazines, there are newspapers, there are brochures, there are notebooks, there are cards, birthday cards, um, Christmas cards, uh, congratulations cards, moving home cards, bills, invoices, delivery notes information that's printed out from the internet, manuals, guarantees, receipts. And on top of that, this client um, worked for several charities. She had um, quite a key role in um, voluntary groups and charities. So she was always attending meetings and whenever she attended meetings, she didn't like looking at um, paperwork on the screen, so she'd always print it off. So I'm just going to admit somebody here, I think, Jordan. Yes, yeah, so sorry, my internet is really dodgy and I had visions oh, of it dropping out and us losing the whole thing. So I no, made that's it fine. Down. It's just popped up. It's absolutely fine. Um, so, so, she, so she would print off all of these minutes, but, you know, that in itself, okay, fine, but she would keep them. Once she printed them off, She's so reluctant to let them go. So when you first walked into a, a house, it wasn't always really evident, but then when you looked on the side of furniture, under chairs, under table, under the bed, down by the side of the windowsill, down by the other side, there were just these stacks of paper of all different types. And, you know, she finds it really difficult to let it go. It's, it's, a, it's a real struggle for her. So categories of hoarding difficulties. The things that I see the most are clothes, paper, bric-a-brac, memorabilia, containers. So things like plastic bags, milk bottle cartons, food, empty food cartons, uh, food. I sometimes see, you know, tinned food that goes back like, 20 years. My mother keeps tins for years and years and years. Um, animals, I've never actually worked um, on um, with a, somebody who hoards, that hoards animals. I've not actually seen that, but it does happen. Data hoarding, that's a new one and quite a big one as well. People who will keep thousands and thousands of emails, thousands and thousands of files and thousands of images as well. So that's, that's a, a, a very new one. So why do they do it? So there's, there's an attachment there somewhere. A lot of people, especially older people I find will say, I'll need it one day. It's the make, do and mend mentality. I won't throw it away because I'm bound to need it. But you know, they've probably not, they've not even known it was there. You know, we're going through things that 
they've not looked at for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And what I hear all the time is, oh, I forgot I had that. Oh, I wondered where that gone. Oh, I've forgotten I'd had that. So they're not things that are functional or useful, but they still find it difficult to let go of them. Memories and meaning. So, I mean, we can all identify with that. I mean, you were saying earlier, Jordan, about um, gifts that have been bought for you. You know, it's quite, it is difficult, I think, when things have been bought for you to be able to let them go. I find that people find, often find that harder than letting go of things that they've bought for themselves because there's a guilt, there's a sense of guilt attached to it. Uh, financial reasons. Well, you know, we invest in the things that we buy. We invest our hard-earned money, and that can be a reason why people hold on. Sentimental memories and meaning. You know, I often find that people will say that they want to keep that piece of paper because it reminds them of a happy time, or it reminds them of a time when they were successful in work or they went to a lovely conference where they had a fantastic meal, or it might be something that was bought for me by my late husband or my granddaughter gave it to me. And then there's something about status. And I do see this, you know, as I said before, with this particular client, I see that a lot with um, people who've had, excuse me, a particular um status in the community, they've had a particular position in the community or they've had a particular job and their paperwork reminds them of that time when they, they were important, when they felt valued and they felt needed. So there's all, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. But I think the key thing with people who've got hoarding difficulties is that, you know, as opposed to the picture I showed you of um, the client that's got ADHD, she was really happy to let things go. She just want, she wanted to be organised. She wanted to get rid of it. I mean, I took loads of stuff to charity for her. But with these clients, it's much trickier because on the one hand, they do want to reclaim the space and they can see that it's causing them a little bit of a problem. That's why they contact people like me. But it's difficult. It causes anxiety. It feels uncomfortable. There's doubt. Should I keep it? Should I not? What if? What if? What if? So it's much trickier for people who've got hoarding difficulties. So um, just to say a little bit about hoarding disorder. So this is the extreme version of um, hoarding well, difficulties. Um, and, um, you know, it's often referred to as the hidden illness because it, it is very much under the radar because people who, you know, suffer at this level, you know, there's so much shame, so much stigma attached to it, not helped by the media because some of the programmes that they've shown around hoarding disorder have, have been quite frankly shocking. You know, they've portrayed it as a, a lifestyle choice, which it definitely isn't. They've portrayed the sufferers as um, lazy, which they certainly are not. So that's not helped the cause. So if you, you know, if you have Hi. difficulties to this level, um, you will already have been criticised. You will have had immense pressure put on you. You will have been nagged about it. You will have probably have been threatened with clearance. So then when you see something on the media that implies that you're lazy or, you know, you're just choosing to live like this, you're going to be much less likely to ask for help. But it is now um, a diagnosable mental health condition since 2013. It affects between three to five percent of the UK population, although that's probably conservative because it is it is such a hidden condition. So people with hoarding disorder have ongoing problems with discarding and it's regardless of the value. So very often they will hoard things that have got absolutely no value to us. It has a value to them though, it has a value somewhere to them, but not to us, not, not, it's not got a, a financial value. So they feel that they need to save items and they get really, really distressed about parting with them. So it's not just a little bit of anxiety. It is real distress, even at the thought of letting go of things. 
But, you know, it can get to the stage where there's a real risk to the health and safety of themselves and others. Um, you know, blocked stairways, um, blocked doorways, not able to open the front door or the back door, um, risk of, you know, hygiene risks to do with hoarded food. So then you've got, you know, environmental concerns. Um, and then, of course, there's a five fire risk. So something like 25% of domestic fires are caused by um, hoarding difficulties and disorders. And it's a huge burden for people who suffer from it and their families, massively so. You know, it, it affects every area of the life. And what I find is that the life just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because you're not going to invite people around, are you? And you're not going to be able to function in the way you once used to be able to. You're not going to be take, not going to take part in hobbies and interests at home because it's all, there's just too much stuff. So why do people hoard? Well, there's something about maybe it's in our DNA because it. we were originally hunter-gatherers. and Stop it, Elliot. Is there, is there somebody that's... Karen, would you mind just muting your audio? We can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. And then in the, you know, in this COVID, COVID pandemic, you know, we've, we've seen a bit of emergency hoarding, haven't we, with the toilet rolls and the pasta and the rice. We've saw, all seen the empty shelves. So there's something about wanting to keep stuff just in case, just in case. But for people who've got hoarding difficulties and hoarding disorder, it's um, strongly associated with loss. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of research in this country um it's most of it comes from america but you know when you talk to people who hoard it won't be very long before they're telling you about some losses or some traumas that they've experienced so losses of loved ones uh, children and pets so empty nest you know once it was a busy house with lots going on and now the children have left and i'm left on my own divorce Maybe it's health and well-being, so maybe you've got um, a physical illness or a physical disability, and so, you know, you lose the motivation to take part in life in the way that you used to, and that's, that's a huge loss. It might be to do with loss of a job or status or just a loss of a, a purpose in life. I've noticed that, um, you know, since my dad has retired, he's now in his early 90s, but since he'd retired, he's become more disorganized and he started to hold things more than he ever did. So I kind of think about all this stuff um, that people have around them that fills every surface that sometimes goes so high it's practically at the ceiling that covers every area of the carpet. I kind of think of it as like insulation. It's like they're wrapping a comfort blanket around themselves. Bit like, I suppose, when, you know, if you're feeling a little bit low or you're having a hard time, you know, we talk about having a duvet day, don't we? That idea of just getting in bed and pulling the duvet up around you and you're sort of um, insulating yourself from the world. I think it's, um, it must feel a little bit like that. It's kind of putting up a safety barrier. And then there's comorbidity because, um, you know, hoarding disorder can go alongside anxiety and depression and other mental health issues. Uh, so how to help somebody who's got hoarding difficulties. And this um, image is um, of um, an elderly lady that I work with quite regularly. Um, and she's making, you know, she's kind of, she is slowly starting to let go of things, but it, it's taken quite a while. So the key things are to listen, understand and show compassion. Definitely, you know, don't judge these people have been judged 
you know, for as long as they've been hoardings. And we know that um, if we judge people and we, if we just tell them to get rid of it and why don't you just do this and why don't you do that, that can have the effect of hardening their views, hardening their opinion, so it makes it worse. It's much better to be curious and find out why. Um, you know, what do these things mean to you? Why do you keep those? How long have you been keeping them for? Why do you enjoy them? Um, is there anybody in your family that also holds on to things? Trying to find some motivation, so a reason for them to start to change their space. So it might be that they've got a hobby or an interest that they've not been able to do for a long, 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 long time. So you can sometimes find a reason, reason for, them, for them to want to start to change the way that they live. Always ask for permission to touch, you know, don't just go um, diving in there, putting your hands all over other people's things. I always ask for, so I will say, shall I open this drawer? Shall I open this cupboard? Shall I take this down? Shall we look at this now? Always ask permission first. Recognising stress, I think that's really important because, um, you know, for example, this client that I work with, when she's starting to get stressed, she will start saying to me, so when I say to her, shall we look at this? Shall we get this? She will say, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch that. And I know then she's starting to feel quite anxious. And that's when we'll have a little break or I'll make her a cup of tea or we'll have a little wander around the garden. So it's looking for those signs of stress and doing something to sort of bring that stress down again. So it might be a little bit of relaxation or whatever, whatever floats there for boat, whatever works for them. Um, I'll often, um, if it's somebody that's got, you know, quite significant hoarding difficulties, I will often focus on the organising and the safety aspects before I even talk about letting things go. So no decluttering to start with. It's just saying to them, how about we just if, see if we can move this somewhere just to make this, make your stairs a little bit safer. How about if we just move this a little bit so we can open your door? How about we just move these so you've got a little bit of space on your table? So, you know, starting um, really small. Praise all progress, um, you know, give because of you know, there are often people who've been um, criticised for a long, long time. They've often got very low self-esteem. So whatever progress is made, however small it is, lots of praise. Focus on small steps. It's not quick work. You have to be very patient. You know, I've had um, discussions for 20 minutes over a piece of elastic that big. You know, so it's not going to happen in a hurry, unlike working with ADHD clients who are very, very fast and we get it all done really quickly. It's all a bit of a whirlwind. It's going to be small steps and it needs to be kept as simple as possible and little and often um, usually works at best. So not expecting people to concentrate on organising for long periods of time because it's just too much. Certainly until they get a little bit more confident, a little bit more in the swing of it. So this is a clutter image rating scale. So this was developed quite a few years ago now and is used widely. And it's a tool and it standardizes the definitions of clutter so that people who were working with people with hoarding disorder and people who have hoarding disorder themselves can kind of rate themselves as to the severity of the clutter in each room. And then it can be quite good for sort of measuring progress and just having discussions about the clutter generally. So um, this is only a little bit of it and it's not very clear, but if you want me to just Google it, it's called the Clutter Image Rating Scale. And you know, it's all over the uh, internet, so um, it's easy to find. And um, so you can rate kitchen, bedroom and lounge. And the ratings go from one to nine, according to the severity of the clutter. Nine is the worst. And they say that anything from four onwards 
um, requires professional help. But I think actually professional help is needed before then because you want you want to stop things getting you know to four and five and six and seven. So the earlier the better. Boarding support, well, there's therapeutic support, um, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, has its uses, as does DBT, which is dialectical behavioural therapy. There's been some really good um, outcomes for DBT because it's about helping people cope with intense feelings. And of course, when people have a hoarding disorder, um, letting go of things, you know, they get very get overwhelmed by intense feelings, which means that they just cannot do it. So that's been very useful. Psychotherapy, bereavement counselling. I work quite a lot with people who are bereaved. And, you know, if the counselling can go hand in hand, that's fantastic. As with, you know, people who've got hoarding difficulties generally, if they can get counselling or therapy alongside, then obviously the outcomes are going to be so much better. There are creative therapies like art and music, and if they've had a previous interest in sort of art, music, drama, writing, then that is, that's definitely a bonus because you've got that motivating factor as well. Hypnotherapy can be useful, also, meditation and mindfulness, uh, meditation particularly, it helps people deal with um, anxious feelings and depression. Exercise is good, for, we know it's good for any, any type of mental health issue. Hobbies and interests, you know, as I said before, you know, if you can get people, if you can get them interested, reignite their interest in, in hobbies and interests, or maybe develop new ones, and that can be a fantastic uh, distraction from continuous acquiring. And then there are various support groups um, across the country, although I don't think there are any in Norfolk where I live. It's very, very patchy. Professional help and information. So I mentioned APDO, the Association of Professional Organisers and Declutterers, if you wanted to get any information about Clutter and, clutter and organising generally. There's lots of uh, information on the website. Um, photo managers, if you're interested in um, getting your photos sorted out. And these are various um, uh, websites specifically for people with hoarding disorders. So Helpful Hoarders, Hoarding Disorders UK, and Clouds NCIC. And then at the bottom, the Institute for Challenging Disorganisation, that's an, uh, an American website. And there's some really interesting information about disorganisation, particularly chronic disorganisation, if you want to find out about that. Thank you so much for being here. So I've just put on here a couple of photographs of things that help me with my mental health, walking on the beach, which I absolutely love as much as possible, and having a cuddle with me dog, having a little sleep with me dog. <laughs> and there's my um, contact information there. If you wanted to get in contact with me, if you had any queries, if I wasn't able to help you directly, I would probably be able to signpost you. So please do feel free. And I've got to say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> See, it was like the last one. I didn't realise it would be the last one before Christmas. <laughs> no, I didn't either. We unfortunately the speaker can't make it next week, so um, yeah, you you ended up with the last slot. But I think I think that was absolutely fantastic and so interesting. Like the um, the two things that stood out for me were the percentages of people who are kind of I guess categorized as hoarders or um, have that that kind of relationship with things I found that super interesting it's higher than I thought and also um, when you were sort of saying about you know they'll have a, an emotional connection with things or they'll struggle to get rid of stuff because of xyz I really it, it really struck a chord with me for from sort of my own perspective like I, I was saying to you before I think some people joined we moved to the Netherlands with nothing and actually that's been really cathartic because 
I've had to be very intentional about what we buy. And it's made me realize that a lot of the stuff that we still have in Norwich is just, just stuff. I don't need it. It's really, it's really interesting. So thank you so much. That was, that was fantastic. Oh, um, thank you. We did have a couple of questions. So um, lots of people saying that it sounded really like them. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Rachel asked, do you think hoarding disorder can be genetic? It, yeah, I mean, there does, there does seem to be, um, whether it's genetic or not, I don't know, whether it's learned behaviour, but there does, it does seem to run in families. Okay. Um, so th there's definitely something there. But going back to what you were saying about, you know, people say they can see themselves, we all do it. We all, I mean, I've got, um, I've got a suit, a dress suit in my wardrobe that I wore to my daughter's wedding. I've just got one daughter, wore it to a wedding. I was the mother of the black bride. It was one of the nicest days I've ever had. You know, all of that, you know, emotion that was connected with it. She got married in 2010. <laughs> it's now 2020. But I mean, I'll never wear that again. It doesn't fit me for a start. And I'm at that age, I never get invited to weddings. It's like a wedding suit. I never get invited to weddings anymore. I won't wear it again. Um, why am I keeping it? I'm keeping it because I just can't bear to get rid of it. <laughs> so we all, you know, we all do it. Pro professional organisers or not, we all do it. We all have attachment to things. It's only when it starts getting a bit out of control that it's a problem. Yeah, I think, and I think that's the key, isn't it? It's like having a few bits here and there is fine, but when when it takes over your the space that you're in, that's that's mm -hmm. when it's an issue. And when when people contact me, one of the first things they usually say is, "It's making me feel really stressed," or right. "I feel overwhelmed with it," or "I don't know where to start." You know, so it's got to the stage where they they really want to do something about it. Hmm. Anita, it's Perry. Um, I just wanted to say about the, the therapies. So um, Hoarding Disorders UK was founded by Joe Cook and yes. another lady called Amanda Pete. And Amanda is a, an emotional freedom technique therapist. Mm. She's also founded something called the emotional dowsing technique. So they're all based on tapping. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with EFT and tapping. Yeah. But it's very, very good at um, getting to your core beliefs about yourself. So if you have had adverse childhood experiences, for example, or if you have low self-esteem, lack of confidence, whatever it may, might be like that, EFT is a very good way of doing... Uh, um, of talking therapy session, if you like, um, because it's mm. physical and you're talking at the same time. It's quite useful for people, for example, if they have um, ADHD or when that's a, that's a type of stimulation. So mm. um, I just wanted to add that one to the list of possible therapies out yeah. there. Yeah, that sounds really, it's not something I know very much about, but it sounds really interesting. I was wondering, so I have, um, like I sort of said in the, in the chat, like my Nana is um, very, she's always kind of, we've always joked like she has loads of stuff and yogurt pots and stuff like that. And, but since she's, um, my, since my granddad died and she's been on her own, she's been much more happy to get rid of stuff. Do you often find that that's the case that people are kind of, they get to a point where they're like, right, maybe now is the time and they have that, that life uh, moment I guess where they they kind of come to that realization that actually it is time to to sort of sort things out yeah and, and what I often find is that there's that they'll often they'll, like I said earlier about there being a motivating factor so people will often have a bit of an ambition or a wish and and the the, the clutter or the disorganization is holding them back mm -hmm. One of the clients that I talked about who where I help her with her paperwork she wants to write a book about her life 
And, um, you know, that's she's had such a fascinating life and that would be fantastic, but she knows that there's no way she could ever start to do that until she gets this paperwork under some kind of control because she knows that in writing a book, she's going to create a load more documentation. She's going to have to do research and all the rest of it. So uh, that and, and when she finds it difficult and she does find it difficult, we have to remember that that's why she, what, so why are you doing, you know, a reminder of why you're doing it so that it's kept center of mind that she's doing this for a reason. And it's about overcoming those, those hurdles that feel very real and strong to her, mm. you know, so that there could, there could be all sorts of reasons why, uh, but, but yeah, very often there's something they want to, accomplish and the clutters holding them back from doing it yeah and and it's interesting as well like do you find that often it's can it be that the clutter is a symptom of perhaps a mental health struggle or is it usually the cause of or is it kind of 50 50 thanks margie <laughs> sorry she's just dropped out <laughs> yes, uh, it's just a real mixture i mean sometimes the clutter actually causes mental ill health mm -hmm. it causes anxiety it causes low mood that can sometimes slip into depression and sometimes it's the other way around so I've got a couple of clients who do suffer with depression endogenous depression and when they're feeling um particularly low they they, they don't have the energy or the motivation or the will or the interest to keep on top of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite shocking how quickly, I think if you're not carrying out those routines every day of, you know, emptying the dishwasher and putting the washing in and dealing with the mail when it comes in and all of those things that we just do almost on autopilot, you know, once you stop doing those, it doesn't take very long. Mm -hmm clutter to build up for the home to become really up disorganized you know it can happen alarmingly quickly so you can imagine if you you know if you're battling with depression and you can barely get out of bed let alone load the dishwasher mm. yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a real problem yeah that's really interesting does anybody Raj do you have a question of questions don't I don't know if they're sort of valid in, in, in the session that you're talking about but um, I spent years having to give up work to be a full-time carer so the reason my clutter if, if there's a background to it is basically because I was so busy organizing and I was caring for multiple members of the family uh, um, quite intensely 24-7 unexpectedly over over a decade for over a decade two decades basically um, so I kept on top of their stuff, but it was always my stuff that got neglected and, and uh, you know, paperwork, all the rest of it used to get piled up. And what used to be, a, you know, I used to be proud that you could eat off my floors. They were so clean when I had my young, little kids and I was mm. really nice and filing. It went the opposite, complete opposite. I was so busy helping everybody else and rushing off to hospitals and dealing with the emergencies, etc. that all my stuff, I did the minimum that I could and I did the raising the kids and doing the school runs and doing the foods and the day-to-day -day stuff, but the, the big spring cleans that we'd have regularly, it all just piled up and my admin piled up and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, I think that and part of some, I think you mentioned before, there's the bereavement. I'd sort of like em emptied my mum's house when she passed um, a couple of years ago. And so I've, I've got some of her stuff, some of it's sentimental, some of it's I've just got stored in my house, um, as well as other stuff. And I've got a step family as well. Um, and it's just masses and masses of stuff. But so I had to also, I suppose my point is I also, I've sorted lots of stuff out. Do you come across situations where you don't really want to or need to once you've got to a certain point of clearing. It's just that you don't have the storage space. Or is it always if you don't have the space, then you need to clear out even more? Because I ended up having to make what was my downstairs. I've got two lounges downstairs. So all of my stuff from my other lounge has been dragged into the other lounge, which is where the one room is all cluttered. It's all on view. because I have no storage and I have no cupboards. So it's all in plastic boxes and bags. 
um because i don't have the cupboards to hide them away now they're sorted through into the categories you were talking about because i had to make the other lounge into an extra bedroom so i lost the space that originally the house wasn't so cluttered because i had space and it had places to be you know where everything went so it felt like there was space i'm not i'm not wearing this very well am i um, but basically, I lost the space, I'd sorted stuff out, so I've got stuff sorted into categories, for example, um, but it's all just on view. Um, I don't know what tips you give people or how people deal with that side of it. I, I, I re-gift a lot, I recycle a lot, and I, I sort of, like you were saying, Jordan, I sort of buy with intent if I thought, I try and recycle as, recycle? recycle as much as I can. Yeah. It was, it's a matter of space because I've had to give up the space things were in before and had to bring things back to the mom's house. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that's completely up to you, isn't it? Whether, you know, you want to, to hang on to those things, whether you've got space for them or not. But, you know, that's completely your decision. What, what I tend to find is that people will say to me, so say for instance it's a particular cupboard and it's got a lot of stuff in it and they will say oh but i want everything in there and i'll say well okay but when was the last time you looked at it and they'll say oh five years ago it might be 10 years ago it might be three years ago 20 years ago. so but when we start to pull everything out and actually go through it, they think that <laughs> they want to keep it. But when they actually see what they've got, they, they very soon change their mind and they will say, no, I've not needed that for 10 years. I don't need it now. I can't imagine ever having ever using that again. Oh, I've already got one of those, so I don't need that. So um, I, I tend to not make any assumptions so, but if a client says to me I definitely don't want to look in that cupboard we're not going to do that cupboard then I don't do it but if there's a if there's a bit of doubt you know if there's a bit of a well you know shall we just let's just check and they're happy to do that then very often there'll be lots of things that they no longer want and then that just you know creating space then Yeah, I think I think it's because I'd lost. I've basically gone down to fifty percent of storage space, which has made yeah. it feel very cluttered. Whereas when it had when it wasn't into that fifty percent space, it it wasn't it didn't feel cluttered. Everything had a place. Yeah, it wasn't all visible. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think I think that's what it is for me. It's not so much that I've got so much more than the average household. I think I've just got nowhere to put it. <laughs> <laughs> or I, yeah. I have got this. I, I need someone to build me cupboards, or I need to buy cupboards. I think <laughs> yeah. just put them out of sight because I've got lots of books and paperwork and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and so may, maybe you know it is about storage and looking at. It is, it is for me. So I wondered if that was part of what your work is, whether you recommend storage yeah. as well. Because yeah, sometimes it a lot of it is about getting rid and clearing out, isn't it? But sometimes yeah. it's it's how it's organised and stored yeah. as well. That's definitely so that's the other half of it really yeah. you know people always will tend to usually know what the decluttering bit is but the other bit the organizing bit is a big part of what we do yeah looking at how to maximize the space that you've got the best way to store it looking at storage solutions yeah all of that is part of what we do and on the I mean, if you did if you were thinking about maybe getting somebody in to help. There is um, a find an organizer um, search bit on the APDO website, you know, so you would be able to find somebody in your area to help, even if, you know, even if just to have a, a, a chat with them initially yeah. and to see how you felt about it. Yeah. 